And one of the things that's going to distract Wilson, of course, is the civil war in Mexico, which had been going on for more than a decade uh, and eventually spilled over into the United States uh, when uh, Mexican forces under Francisco Pancho Villa uh, attacked a uh, town, Columbus, New Mexico, and the nearby camp of the United States Cavalry was there. Uh, the attack for Pancho Villa backfired uh, because about half of his troops were very quickly chased down, shot, killed, captured. He himself was wounded, but in response, President Wilson is going to call up the entire National Guard, including troops of the Texas National Guard. Uh, the National Guard had only been created in 1903 by Congress, so this is its first major mobilization. And the Guard goes down to the Rio Grande border to keep something like this from happening again, and then four-fifths of the American Army, under the command of General John J. Blackjack Pershing, invade Mexico for the purposes of catching or killing Pancho Villa. And so now Wilson's got this entanglement on our southern border, which is making things a little bit awkward for him. Uh, it's a good thing that the, the Sussex Pledge has been made because trying to juggle both of those things at the same time would have been very difficult. Uh, you know, ultimately, Pershing's punitive expedition winds up 400 miles deep inside Mexico. Uh, it never does get Pancho Villa, although it wounded him early on and, and removes him from the scene. The punitive expedition, as it's called, is actually a success at its primary mission, which is to secure the American border, uh, to keep something like the raid on Columbus from ever happening again. Uh, but because Wilson had said its mission was to get Pancho Villa, it can't withdraw if it hasn't caught Pancho Villa. And months and 400 miles into Mexico, the Mexican government got tired of the presence of American troops and actually sent Amer uh, Mexican troops to confront them. And there were a couple of skirmishes that threatened to embroil the United States in a war with Mexico. Fortunately, that's not something the leader of Mexico or the leader of the United States wanted, so the two sides sort of backed off and agreed to stare at each other for a while. Wilson was unwilling to have the punitive expedition withdrawal as a presidential election loom, because that's the other thing that's happening in 1916, isn't it? In that November, there's going to be a presidential uh, election. Wilson, a Democrat, is going to run for a second term. And it was very unlikely he would get a second term because he had only gotten into office in 1912 because of a split in the Republican Party between the progressive Teddy Roosevelt and the conservative William Taft. Uh, the Democrats, therefore, have every reason to anticipate that a united Republican Party is going to defeat Wilson in 1916. The Republicans nominated Charles Hughes, who was a Supreme Court justice, uh, to run, and both Hughes and Wilson were progressives. There really wasn't a lot to choose between them. Hughes needed to differentiate himself from Wilson somehow, and he did that by saying that Wilson had gone too easy on the Germans, that, that if Hughes had been president, he would have taken a tougher stance against the Germans and their U-boat threat, and that allowed Wilson to play Hughes as a war candidate, to say, if you vote for Wilson, you're voting to keep the United States out of World War I. If you vote for Hughes, you're voting to take the United States into World War I. And so Wilson's primary campaign slogan, he kept us out of war, which was translated in the minds of a lot of Americans to, he will keep us out of war. Despite that, it was a very close campaign, and the reality that the Republican Party was the majority party and the dominant party uh, weighed very much against the chances of Wilson getting reelected. Uh, but to almost everyone's amazement, Wilson managed to pull out a very narrow victory. The, the South, the old Confederacy, which was solidly Democratic, stuck with him, and the West went Democratic as well. Uh, so Wilson won re-election, uh, and he won a second term by a margin of only 600,000 popular votes. So in a contest that was in essence a surrogate for the question, go to war, don't go to war, we find that the American people are almost evenly divided in 1916. The irony is that having gotten reelected in November of 1916, Wilson now knows that he's got only probably a handful of months to try and broker the peace in Europe that he 
hopes can be achieved without victory before the Germans tire of the Sussex Pledge and resume unrestricted submarine warfare. Wilson's hopes that he can accomplish that, however, are completely undermined by the outbreak of the Russian Revolution. Uh, the Russian government had mismanaged its war effort horribly. Uh, it had stripped the civilian economy to keep its armies in the field, and uh, although the Russian people had fought very bravely and were very dedicated to their, their country uh, and to victory, uh, their armies had performed badly. So in essence, you had uh, caused this horrible domestic hardship without a corresponding military advantage. And the government of Tsar Nicholas uh, was very unpopular, it was very autocratic, and that opened the door for revolution. And so the Russian Revolution breaks out in January of 1917. Ultimately, it will lead to the Bolshevik uh, Revolution, the rise of the communists in Russia. Uh, and when the Bolsheviks get in charge, they want to concentrate on consolidating their power in Russia, which means that they're willing to make a separate peace with the central powers. And so the Russians drop out of the war. The Russians drop out of the war. And when the Russians give up, that means that for the first time, the Germans can concentrate most of their military force on the Western Front. They'll have a numerical superiority against England and Belgium and France for the first time, and therefore the Germans see the possibility of actually winning this conflict outright. And to that end, they determine to prep the battlefield by resuming unrestricted submarine warfare, knowing that this would probably drag the United States into the war. The Germans were willing to take that calculated risk for a couple of reasons. First, they believed that their new numerical superiority in the Western Front and new tactics that they had developed, stormtrooper tactics, would allow them to breach the Allied lines, capture Paris, and win the war. The Germans also knew that the American army was very small. If you count the regular army and the National Guard together, the United States had less than 250,000 troops. We had virtually no airplanes, no radios, no trucks, no tanks, no artillery pieces. It would take the Americans years to mobilize, the Germans believed, and even longer to get a substantial army into Europe. And by that time, the Germans were certain that they would have won the war. But being a very thorough people, the Germans weren't going to take any chances. They knew that declaring unrestricted submarine warfare would most likely bring the United States into the conflict. And a way to ensure that the Americans had no impact on the Western Front was to embroil them in a war in the Western Hemisphere. So the Germans sent an offer to Mexico, and this is the infamous Zimmerman uh, telegram, which was actually a radio transmission intercepted and decoded by the British and then turned over to the United States. They called it a telegram to try and conceal the fact that they had intercepted and decoded a German radio message. And the Zimmerman telegram tells the Mexicans where, that Germany is going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, that it's going to attempt to keep the United States neutral. But in the event that that doesn't work, they're making Mexico an offer of alliance on the following terms. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer her lost territories in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. When the Zimmerman telegram landed on Wilson's desk, he finally understood that the German government was hostile to the United States. Mexico wisely wanted nothing to do with this offer, uh, but for the American people, it was now clear that Germany was an enemy and had malicious intent toward the United States. And close on the heels of the Zimmerman telegram, of course, come the renewal of unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, and in just a couple of weeks, at the beginning of March uh, of 1917, German U-boats sank five American ships in the Atlantic. And at that point, Wilson knows he has no other choice. He goes before the Congress on April 2nd of 1917, and he asks it to declare war on Germany. And on April 6th, the United States Congress did exactly that. So now, finally, the United States is in World War I. And how ironic, Wilson elected November of 1916 on the promise he kept us out of war, 
in April of 1917, just a month after he's inaugurated for a second term, takes us into what was at that point in time the bloodiest war in human history. Americans responded enthusiastically to the outbreak of war. Uh, they rushed to the colors as they always do uh, when the country enters a conflict. Uh, and almost 200,000 Texans will serve in the armed forces of the United States during World War I. Uh, Texas will supply the fourth highest number of troops of any other state. Only Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania will provide more troops uh, to the American war effort uh, than Texas. Uh, 